I would like to go through the AI Objectives Institute white paper. And I would like to compare what they're saying to my own thinking on this channel because obviously on this channel I'm looking at paradigm shifts in governance, in economics, and in epistemics, which is of course how we know what is true and what is valid. And um, obviously artificial intelligence is going to be one of the key drivers of major paradigm shifts at this moment in history. And the way this white paper sets up thinking about the hope of the future when it comes to restructuring institutions and restructuring sort of the, uh, the way the economy works, the way they're thinking about this, um, it, it influenced my thinking, it fits really well with the way I'm thinking about things, and so I'd just like to go through what they're saying to compare. And I will link below to their white paper that I'm outlining here. I highly recommend going and reading it yourself. So they basically identify two different problems that we need to solve when it comes to artificial intelligence, where one of these problems is the misalignment problem, the problem that artificial intelligence may have its own objectives, or, and perhaps this is the bigger one, it may have objectives that align with existing power structures and that kind of exacerbate power to the powerful in a way that we don't like. And then the second problem is the Goodhart's Law problem. And this basically says as soon as something becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And of course, artificial intelligence is, it operates by coming up with its own metrics and its own measures, whether those are explicit and observable to us, or whether they are under the invisibility cloak of the AI. So those are sort of the two big realms of AI-based problems that this white paper identifies. And I really appreciate that this paper takes a hopeful approach. And they do that without, uh, without ignoring the problems that AI is going to bring up in these realms. They very much acknowledge the nature of the problems we're up against. But they say um, these problems do parallel some of the system level problems we've had in the past. And there have been moments where we've made progress against those system level problems. And that includes things like antitrust laws and the civil rights era movements and all of these moments in history when when there was something the system was doing that was exacerbating power to the powerful and some group came along and counteracted that in a way that was healthy. So their hope basically is that we could use AI to counteract the power to the powerful notions. So here's a hopeful quote from the article. We remain optimistic that we can use the new gods to tame the old ones. Now they set up this ecosystem with different layers and this really parallels the way I'm thinking about the institutional ecosystem. Although there's going to be a few differences which I'll point out in a second. Their top layer is government and markets. Their middle layer, they are calling specific institutions or individual institutions. And their bottom layer is individual people. And they, they recognize that there are deep interconnections between these three layers. And then if we're thinking about the way AI is going to influence the whole system, we need to be thinking at every single layer. Now, I have two comments on this where one is more semantic and the other, I think, is somewhat more substantial. And the semantic one is that economists use the term institutions more broadly than they are using it here. In fact, what they call individual institutions, institutional economists would call those organizations where an organization is a specific group of people under a specific institutional structure. And this includes firms, it includes regulatory bodies, it includes schools and colleges and whatnot. And um, that's simply something that um, we just have different language for in economics. Because in economics, institutions include sort of all of the rules that structure human relationships including like marriage and family and markets in a way where it includes people's expectations of different roles within a market. So to be specific, my definition of an institution is the rules, roles, and enforcement mechanisms that structure human relationships. And of course that goes along with people's expectations. 
like something's not going to be enforced very well unless everybody in the institution understands what roles involve what rules. And I mean, the institution of marriage is a good example here where marriage is something that, yeah, there are legal enforcements, but the main enforcement of marriage and the expectations around what a spouse will do in marriage and what they will not do, most of that is in the social layer of society. And this gets at my more substantial tweak to their model, which is that I'm okay with those three layers, but I would add a top layer that is above markets and government. And that I'm going to call mental infrastructure, where mental infrastructure is people's general understanding of how the system works. So this includes people's understanding of what marriage is and what are the obligations that go along with marriage. They include people's understanding of what is bad behavior that you can socially look down upon and what is admirable behavior that will lead other people to admire you. They include just how people think about expectations and morality and all of that. And it, it's mental infrastructure because it's not contained in an individual brain. It's, um, it's across brains. It's sort of like, what does everybody know that everybody else knows about the rules of the game in the economy or in the, the social world? And of course, it also includes rules and rules about how you interact with the system. Like, what, is an, what does a like mean or an upvote? What does, how do you interact with um, revolving doors? Like, just people's general knowledge of how to interact with the system they exist within. And of course, artificial intelligence is likely to come in and rejigger people's expectations and incentives at that very highest level. And that's one of the big things I think we need to pay attention to, because that highest level structures every level below it. And I also want to point out that, yes, the mental infrastructure layer does have a relationship that's pretty direct with the individual human's layer, particularly when that layer comes through their smartphone as they're interacting with the screen. Oh, and here's a really interesting quote from the article regarding the structure of economies. Market economies are structurally very similar to artificial neural networks. Now, the article talks about the problems that AI could bring on the scene. And one of them, of course, with these large language models is the persuasive power of, uh, of the artificial intelligence and the content it's putting out. And that's both persuasive power to persuade populations, but also perhaps persuasive power to, to persuade individuals in key roles in the economy. The article talks about how AI could supercharge different parties' ability to exploit loopholes in the legal structure or in the online structure, the sense-making structure. And the exploitation of loopholes kind of goes along with what they call um, the corporation as a psychopath. And the analogy of the corporation as a psychopath that has its own goals, but it is not at all sensitive to the collateral damage it does, I think that's a really powerful analogy. Now, I'm not going to expound on it here because this video is more about the hope that's laid out in the article than about the problems, but I also talk about those problems many times in other videos. So if we return to the hope side of this, the article points out a number of functions that AI could serve to counteract this power to the powerful dynamic. And I'd like to go through four of them, where the first one here is going to be better polling mechanisms. Like AI could figure out better ways of aggregating population grievances, um, uh, better ways of figuring out what does the population want and need. And I think this is super important because one of the things I think going on is that people in very powerful positions are pretending to speak on behalf of the people or the population, and they're just getting it wrong. But there's not really good mechanisms for fixing that or for the population to speak back to that and say, 
no, actually you're getting this part wrong, you're getting this part right, here's how we actually think of this, here's the problems we actually see. So polls right now, I, I think you're not doing a great job, partially because of the trust issue, but there needs to be a way that the population can speak back to powerful forces that are enacting their own values without necessarily being super in touch with uh, the grievances or the side effects of their, their actions. The second hopeful function that AI could serve would be a regulatory function. Like, it could come in and fill in some of the gaps that regulatory bodies should be doing, but perhaps are not doing. And of course, there's lots of reasons why regulatory bodies may not uh, not function that well. Uh, partially, they just may not be as up on the technology side as they would need to be to regulate effectively. But AI could potentially come in and come up with different metrics and different um, measures of whether something is out of control, whether there's a violation of antitrust, all of that. And let me read you another quote from the article on this. Can research on generating better ensembles of metrics provide tools to reduce the possibility of gaming the system. In other words, if we're worried about powerful actors gaming the system, could you have AI that's out there looking for that kind of bad behavior and alerting the public or alerting the population or alerting people who have the power to come in and regulate effectively to do their job. The next hopeful AI function is collective action or collective decisions. And here's another quote from the article on that. Could advances in language models, recommendation systems, and human-computer interaction make it easier for large groups to come to collective decisions than with traditional methods. And collective action includes union bargaining. It might include bargaining on our behalf for use of our data. For example, maybe if I'm generating data, I don't want it to be used in ways that uh, addict the population to uh, social media or that cause negative effects on mental health. And there's probably lots of people who feel the same about the way their data is used. So could artificial intelligence come in and say, actually, I can figure out how the 10,000 of you who want this certain thing could come together and use your power whatever power that might be, whether it's our labor or our data or whatnot, to actually act against powerful forces that want their will to be implemented. And then the last hopeful tool I'll talk about here is the AI could assess AI. So if you have some large corporation or some government entity that's sort of putting out metrics that are some sort of financial credit score metric or social credit score metric or something that the population considers perhaps um, violating their rights in some way, could you have AI that goes in and tries to figure out where is that happening and how is that happening and how can it use these mechanisms like collective action mechanisms to act against that? If there are AIs out there that are biased and biased in ways that um, favor certain populations over the other, can you have other AIs that counteract that by trying to scout out the bias and trying to at least, at the very least, alert people to what's going on and perhaps counteract it in some way? Now, obviously that list is going to apply mainly to the layers of government and markets and also specific institutions. That's how those tools would play out. But they also mention ways that AI could have tools that act on the individual human. And this was one part of the article that, um, that worried me a little bit when I first read it. And I don't think this is because I actually disagree with it necessarily. But I think there's a huge asterisk and they didn't expound upon that asterisk that needs to be there. So basically they talked about using AI to nudge people out of human irrationalities. And some examples they gave are Socratic chatbots that will ask people questions that will make them reflect on their own values and how their own 
consumption of information and their own behavior, perhaps in the online environment, is consistent with the values they are trying to uphold. They also talked about browser plugins that warned people about manipulative content. Like if this content is meant to get you in an emotional state that will uh, rile up anger and make you outraged or whatnot, it would be nice to have a plugin that will say, warning, this content um, is deemed by somebody to be manipulative. They give the example of an AI algorithm that might redirect you away from doom scrolling. So maybe you put in, I don't want to doom scroll. I don't want to keep going if this is going to put me in a really angry, upset, depressed mood. And so maybe you could have something that would be like, actually, let's redirect to the cat videos if you seem to be doom scrolling. And then they talk about reward functions that they could perhaps rejigger with AI that paid attention to positive and negative behavioral nudges, essentially. So let me explain my initial negative reaction to this and how I'm still somewhat on board so long as basically people can actually choose which group gets to decide on the nudging techniques that they're opting into. Like if, if it's coming from the top, from powerful people setting up nudges as they see fit, I would absolutely not be in support of this. And this is something that I think a lot about because I teach behavioral economics and recently I've built in an ethics component to my behavioral economics course. So in my own ethical framework on nudging, I've come to the viewpoint that if, if someone's going to be nudged in a way that shapes how they feel, how they think, the information they take in or don't take in, then they need a pretty close democratic um, accountability over the people who are deciding on the nudges. And that if you have a bottleneck of democracy where you vote once every four years and it really only boils down to five issues, none of which have to do with the nudging, that is not democratic enough um, for me to be comfortable with the depth of nudging that they're talking about here. Because of course, this layer of nudging influences not just the bottom layer of people and individuals, it influences the very top layer of the mental infrastructure of the population. So there are huge incentives for powerful actors to come in and structure people's expectations about, you know, roles, rules, and enforcement mechanisms in favor of the existing power structures. So I'm personally not okay with um, the existing democratic structures controlling nudges on this level. But if there are different options where you can choose, actually this group is aligned with my values, this group understands the problems that I see in the world, the ways I do not want to be manipulated, then I can choose to hand over my power to that group to nudge me in a way that is aligned with my own values. That is something I would super support. And that, that's the asterisk here, is who controls these nudging mechanisms? Who is behind it? And is the democratic accountability there strong enough for individuals to opt in, opt out, to, uh, to look at what's going on inside the group that's doing the nudging and see transparently what they're trying to accomplish. Okay, I could probably go on and on about this article. I really loved reading it, but I think I'll stop there.